Then by the time we returned from uh, Sri Lanka, Murugesu had arranged, of course, a thousand mile tour of Sri Lanka, which we did. Different spiritual centers in the whole of the island. Not Sriorobindo centers, but whatever the centers they all wanted. And uh, so we had a tour. He engaged a special van and we did a thousand mile tour of Sri Lanka. After that, we came back. That visit also was not long, maybe a fortnight or so. When we came back, many invitations from the West were waiting. Because we had the passport. By the way, we didn't have to make any effort to get the passport. The governor at that time was Chedi Lal, mm. who had already got Madhav to address some meetings at the government house, in his house, on spiritual subjects. So he called one of his men and said, get all the, the visa, passport and everything for Mr. Pandit. I don't want him to go and sit there in that office waiting for this. So they went and got it, and for me to accompany, I was taken as his secretary. A man could be accompanied by his secretary, you see. We had to give the reason, otherwise government wouldn't allow, you see. So as his secretary, I was given that. So we didn't know how much effort went into the getting of a passport and a visa to any particular foreign country. Everything was done by the government people at the governor's behest. We only packed a few things. and But immediately we didn't go. The itinerary had to be planned. Madhu said, we have already gone out twice and then and America is a very large country and so many invitations have come mm. from the west, from the east and from the north and travelling itself would take time. That means absence for a longer time from the ashram. So he just kept quiet. And then the invitation came from Baroda. We had not yet gone to any Indian centre. The Baroda centre was located in the very house where Sri Aurobindo had stayed, lived for many years. It was the house of a nobleman and uh, there Sri Aurobindo was lodged when he arrived in Baroda and entered the state government service. The Maharaja had engaged him in London. When he was in London, Maharaja had met him and he had engaged him on the spot. Sri Aurobindo was 21 years old. Mm. He was received very well in uh, Baroda and he was uh, lodged immediately, no uh, lodgings were found for him. So he was in the house of uh, that nobleman who liked Sri Aurobindo so much, he kept him in his house as a guest for a number of years. I have seen that house where, uh, perhaps you have been there to Baroda? Yes. That swing on which he had sat. Yes. Yes. Room of silence and all that. Yes. Well, so we went. When we went, the relics had not been installed. They had been received, but they were in a special place, uh, kept there, awaiting the uh, construction of a proper shrine for it. So, Madhu was hesitating. So they asked. They were coming here for darshan. They said, mm. "Do you intend going only to foreign countries?" <laughs> <laughs> you must not forget your own country and our centers. And there was a all Gujarat conference to, uh, to take place in Baroda. Gujarat, there were many centers, and uh, the Baroda was the chief center, the largest and the chief center. So uh, they said, you must come and be this chief speaker, chief guest. So Madhav had to say, yes, how could he neglect uh, uh, such a center? So we went there by plane. That was that's another story. The Gujarat our visit to Gujarat. That was the only Indian center that we went to before going to America. Then you knew Tatsat, the young man called Tatsat. He took it upon himself uh, to arrange the itinerary. Earlier, Surendra Mohan Ghosh, who was the vice president of World Union Journal had asked Madhu if we could go on tour, on a world tour, and the government would, Indian government would arrange mm. everything 
and all the lodging, everything at government expense, and they would, the embassies in each country would arrange the meetings. Well, Madhav had not planned to go out at that time, so he declined. Yes, he didn't go. Now we went, a young man of twenty-six, sent Madhav's uh, biodata and the published books and all that to different uh, universities, but before that, the centers that already existed, like, like, like Jyoti Priyas and yes. some others and so on, yes. our friends who were already there, and Eleanor Montgomery from In New, York. New York, she was a good friend. And uh, about her, I have to say something interesting. I saw my first interview, I have not mentioned Eleanor there, but there is something very interesting uh, to tell you, what Mother said to her. You know. So, Eleanor Montgomery from the East, mm -hmm. Yudhi Priya from the West, and uh, some other things, and not only that, the Ramakrishna Mission people, in whichever country Madhav visited, they were very welcoming to him, because he, they used to send him books for review in their journals, and he, they admired his reviews very much, the spiritual books. And uh, some of the Swamis that he knew as editors of the journals were heads of certain centers in uh, America, like the Vedanta Society in Los Angeles also, then the uh, other, Chicago. So they invited Madhav to speak at Vivekananda the temple and took him where this. So this, uh, and uh, Swami Satchidanand of uh, that integral yoga center, he used to visit the ashram every year and used to meet Madhav. So they also invited. So they came, he received invitations from other spiritual centers plus some universities where some of our people were working as professors and so they wanted these universities to be visited. So all these letters were put together and they were sung which so that we wouldn't go, have to go back and forth. Uh, that's a terrained, uh, from one part when we go, mm -hmm. on the way we would stop for some days here, speak at a university, then move on and stand, arranged a large van. He tore off all the seats. Stan was also in his early twenties, imagine. He bought a van and uh, put uh, two gorgeous, very comfortable armchairs, actually four, two, four armchairs for well, we were a party of, you see, Stan, Tatsat, Barbie. Oh, Barbie, also. Because Barbie had become a special friend of Tatsat, you see. Yes. yes. So, Barbie, and we were new to everything, so three young Americans would be with us, mm -hmm. because we would know nothing about it. Even in India, we hadn't visited the big cities. Madhav had studied in Bombay, but, you see, Bombay was completely changed by the time we went mm -hmm. abroad. So Stan has the itinerary was worked out and that is how it happened. But there was still time for it and we were preparing for it. So our Singapore friends said, we had predicted, hadn't we, that you would be going to America. <laughs> now it's coming sooner than expected. So this is how we started. Now this um, slight digression, this Eleanor Montgomery. I knew her very well. Hmm? Yes, very well. And uh, because you were you were in New yeah, York, yes. And she became a great friend of Madhu's when she st came here, and uh, she stayed at Golcond. And uh, she would often sit there in Madhu's office uh, and have some talks with him. And then she shared this little bit um, after the final interview she had with Mother before going back to the United States. She was feeling a little low because she was going. She loved being here. She had loved being here. She had made so many friends here. She loved being at Golconda and Mother was very, very sweet to her. Mm. So she came and sat in the chair next to Mother's, you know, next to Mother's there was a chair. And then she said, you know, I'm going back. And it seems, then she told Mother, she told Madhu that she had told Mother. And Mother said something about the spiritual things and all that and the developments. 
Then she said, but Mother, your ashram is here and I'll be in New York, I'll have to go very far. Then Mother looked at her a little quizzically and she said, you know something? The whole world is my ashram. What a terrific statement! She says to Eleanor, you know something? The whole world is my ashram. This I heard her say with my own ears. You see, the Divine doesn't come to earth only for one community and one ashram. The Divine comes for the whole world, yes. for all humanity. Yes. And this is how she made Eleanor feel that Eleanor would be doing mother's work even in New York. Mother fully expected her to do Sirobindo's and mother's work, help in it, you see. She was one of the pioneers there in New York. Mm. The whole world is my ashram. It just stuck in my memory like that. Yeah. I saw, I saw what mother felt for all the children in the world. So I said to myself, Mother, I've never wanted to be anywhere outside the ashram. Even going out for a short while was difficult. Even to Singapore and Sri Lanka, devotees and all were there, but I kept missing the ashram. So America is still further. I don't know what you expect me to do in this case. I don't think I'll feel comfortable anywhere. Then this sentence came to my mind, the whole world is my ashram. So if Mother felt that, that maybe she wouldn't think that I was uh, infringing any kind of law or anything like that. Being, of being an ashramite. But still, I was not enthusiastic about it, that I admit, because I was very attached to this place, you see. I wasn't uh, doing anything. But there was another experience that I remembered having in the playground. When Mother was uh, there meditating, and then suddenly, I felt, no, this was uh, in the ashram main building itself. That, that experience was different, that I'm, I'll start talk of it some other time. What happened was this, I was waiting to go to Mother. It was on the first floor. Mm. She used to live on the first floor and at that time the new room had been built. She used to go up only to rest and sleep. Afterwards she would spend the rest of the their time on the first floor. And people met her there on the first Where floor. Where her cot was and Sri Aurobindo's chair? No, that is different. There, was a, there is a chair that you, there is a room that uh, you pass in order to go to the top room. There is a couch there near the door opening onto the terrace and the yes. little staircase yes. goes to north. Yes, I know. Yeah. She used to see, uh. There is one chair there, a narrow chair which is on the way. She used mm -hmm. to sit there in the afternoons yes. and meet <coughs> Amrita, uh, Kunuma and Madhu there. They used to sit around her. There's a uh -huh. narrow chair is there, you pass it yeah, as you go to the couch. It has a photo on it now, yes. the chair. Yes. She used to sit there mm -hmm. and they used to sit around her. And at some other time she would be sitting that side and then receive people. So that whole, that was her room actually, she lived there. But it was open to everyone, you see. That's the reason why she needed afterwards a separate room to herself, which everyone couldn't, you know, use as a passage or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, I was waiting to go upstairs. That was after she went to the top room. Mm -hmm. I was waiting in that, that middle room, that on the first floor, waiting to be called, you see. Champaklal or Vasudha would be calling me. Mm -hmm. Not only me, there may have been one or a few people, I, I don't remember, because when I waited for Mother at that time, 
I used to be oblivious uh, to everything else. So as I was sitting there, I suddenly saw myself sitting there and uh, all around me there are those walls of the ashram, you know, four walls, because on all four, mm -hmm. four sides the walls are there in the street outside. Those walls suddenly fell and I was simply exposed to the open space, or to the world. I said, what's the matter? You see, the walls on all four sides had just, just fallen. And I was just sitting there, like a child exposed to the whole world before me. I said, what's the main significance of this? I am exposed to the whole world. The walls have fallen, and there I am. This uh, I remembered when I was about to go to America. The walls had fallen and I was just going out. I wasn't afraid or anything like that, but it was something peculiar, how that could happen. It wasn't that the ashram was disturbed, it, it didn't have any bad uh, feeling, but it was just that I was exposed to the whole world. That was the thing, the feeling of being a child, playing in mother's garden and walls falling and completely exposed to the world. Mm. And I was afterwards completely exposed to the world, uh, Europe and America. Yes. Yes. So many visits. For the next ten years I was touring, traveling almost continuously. And uh, even afterwards, after stopping uh, going to America, for the next two years we still were visiting Europe. So what year did you go to America? 77. Because 76, Sri Lanka mm -hmm. and Baroda. Because they said, you have to come to B B Indian Center now. So Baroda. 77, we went to America. Beginning in the east on the east coast. Yes, because Barbie's mother was there. Huh? Of course, Rutledge, Tompkins told Martha, yes. "You better start from California, oh. because now the climate there, the there they are snowbound these things, and you are not used to it. If you start from the west coast of America and travel to the east yes. coast, it would be more easier for you." But Tatsat was adamant, he said, all the itinerary has been fixed, we have to start from the East Coast. From Barbie's mother lived, um, you know, a little away from, from uh, New York uh, airport, I think it was about uh, one and a half to two hours journey where she lived. Maybe she lived in New Jersey. No, I forget the name, I have the itinerary. We had to go there. And as for Madhav, he had no idea how cold it would be and mm. how he would have... He said, yes, it's all right, with be cold or whatever. The itinerary had been planned, the universities and all, they had given their dates. They like to give much in advance because they advance, they give, the itin they make the itinerary a year in advance or at least so many months in advance. Nothing could be changed. Madhav said, it's okay. You see, he was game for everything. He mm. was this, he could endure a lot and uh, he said yes. And as for me, what did I know? I had lots of relations living in the West of my own age. Now they are old. In that generation also, uh, there were cousins and aunts and others, so many living in different places whom I was not going to visit because I didn't know them and besides my program was fixed. I didn't have even a single day in my hand to have any private uh, programs. So I said it was okay. We can uh, buy the warm clothes there, that's what uh, Tatsat said. But what we didn't know was that our plane couldn't land in New York. So it was a uh, airport, you know, foggy, and so we were circling over it. Philadelphia perhaps. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia, was it, is it just to the yes, south? Yes, New York, Philadelphia, Washington. Philadelphia, we were there, we were there and so on. But finally we went back to New York and we, after a delay there, we landed there. Well, our tour started from there. Yes. 
Of course, Eleanor Montgomery met Martha, and she said, uh, she expressed her happiness at seeing Martha in America. You're just the man I wanted to see here, just the man. And I have got everything fixed for if you are interested, everything fixed for you. I have. She was sure that Martha would like whatever she had fixed for him. Her plan was that she had already spoken to the government people and then spoken to the Indian Embassy. And some kind of a centre was to be there and connected with that and they would ha help him to run it and he would be able to stay in the United States without any trouble. Huh? This was Eleanor. <laughs> this is just like Eleanor. She commanded so many things, yes. commanded so many things. And she had decided the mother would come and now settle in America, in New York, because she liked the idea of that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. So she, were, but uh, she was very disappointed when Madhu said, you know, I've only got a visa, I've come for three months visit. I have to be back in the ashram. I had, I had not thought of settling in America, he said. Oh, she tried to persuade him, and then she was very disappointed. She said, you were just the man needed by us here, yes, needed here. And, well, anyway, uh, that is just by the way, Eleanor, mm -hmm. warm this thing, but... Uh, then we followed the itinerary. Most of the people in the audiences were those whom we had already met in the ashram. Oh. They had heard of us, itinerary had been sent to them because they had asked whether mother would be in that area. So there were many universities and also other spiritual centers and everywhere our own people had settled. Because people, the devotees had settled all over the United States. So they all came to meet us. Of course, when they came to meet us, we felt ourselves at home because it was like seeing them in the ashram. They made it a little easier for us, you know, yes. Yes, easier for us. Yes. And Jyoti Priya, of course, I had known her uh, from day one of her visit here oh. in 47. In 47, she when became, she came from Benares? Yes. Because I was at that time, I had just settled down here in August, and I think Jyoti Priya must have come in November or something like that. That's what Mandakini told me. And then uh, I, at that time, was very friendly with a um, girl who was doing her uh, MA in philosophy in Banaras Hindu University. And she was Aurobindo Basu's pupil. So Aurobindo Basu arranged for Judith Tyberg's visit to the ashram and he also wrote to his pupil to look after her because the pupil was at Golconda and Jyoti Priya was to stay at Golconda. Mm -hmm. Because Jyoti Priya was, you know, new to this ashram. So he thought that his pupil would be, you know, at hand to mm -hmm. help her yes. and all that. Now that girl had become very friendly with me. So we used to go for meditations together and uh, all that. And uh, I had not yet become officially an ashramite because I was underage. Uh, they didn't want to accept me as an officially as an ashramite until I had turned at least eighteen. So I was there waiting to be accepted, and in the meantime, I was treated like an ashramite, but uh, they wasn't given any room in the ashram. I had mm. to have private lodgings, you know. So I became very friendly with these visitors. We went everywhere together and she brought Jyoti Priya into my life. Oh. And she was very impressed by Jyoti Priya, so many degrees, so scholarly. And now she has come to do further, you know, research and other things at uh, Banaras Hindu University. So we became close friends. Somehow Jyoti Priya took to me. and. Uh, we became very close friends. I still remember the tips she gave me. And uh, one, one or two things that she told me, they seemed a little strange to me because I was never going to America, you know. She said, when you are in America, you don't ever do this or that, something like that, she told me. Uh. And I said to myself, I've come here to join the ashram. Huh? 
how will I be in America? <laughs> <laughs> and Jyoti Priya, she just told me what are the do's and don'ts and some of the things that were done there and uh, what she had experienced. She was just sharing that with me. A young girl should know these things, she felt. Now all those things I remembered when I finally uh, went to America in my forties. But she wasn't much older than you, Jyoti Priya. No. How much older than you was she? I was born in 1930. And she? No, she was uh, older at that time. Uh -huh. I think she was in her forties. Oh, was she? Uh -huh. Because she had already done lots of things. Mm -hmm. She was not a young student. Mm -hmm. But she got the chance to come to this thing. She already had so many degrees. And she was uh, teaching at so many places. She was not a young student, but she was not old, you know. She was in early middle age. Yes. You said I was also in early middle age, you might say, when I went to America. Yeah. I was not young. Yes. So this is what she told me. You <laughs> don't never do this when you are there. Guidelines for a young girl. Because I wouldn't know anything of that society, you see. I wouldn't be knowing. Sure. She was so free with me and shared so many things with me. Oh. And I imbibed it all. Just as this Eleanor also, Eleanor also used to say so many things to me because she would be, when Mother was busy, she would find me sitting there doing some work and she would engage me in conversation. She was very friendly. I liked her very much indeed. Oh, I find, I found her very elegant, very stylish. Very. Oh, very stylish. Well, anyway, there were, we knew some friends, so it was all right. They made us feel at home and uh, Madhav felt it worthwhile because many new people came also wanting to have the teaching. Now, Mother had told him, I don't know whether I have told you in the first interview, I have not told you. Mother had told him when uh, he was in World Union, A.B. Patel and uh, J. Holmes Smith and others, they asked Madhav to lend his support to World Union. Pastor Aurobindo believed in the unity of humanity and all that. Yes. So at that time, Mother said to Madhav, when you speak to other audiences, because as a on the World Union platform, he had to speak to people who were not disciples, mm. who might not even be interested in spirit matters yeah. of the spirit. Yes. But he had to, you know, have some mm -hmm. kind of an interact, meaningful uh, interchange with them. She said, when you speak to them, first talk only about the principles and the ideas of Sri Aurobindo. In the in philosophy or in the spheres of uh, uh, social development or world unity, just talk of those. And after they have heard you, if they want to know, if they are impressed, and if they want to know from whom you learnt it, then only you can speak about us. Oh. Yeah. And this is exactly what happened at some of the meetings there, where. Uh, people were not disciples and not even interested in spiritual matters. But because he was uh, writing for the World Union, people yeah. had heard of him, worldwide contacts for World Union were there. On World Union platforms also he spoke there in different places. There he first spoke only of the, the philosophy, the social philosophy mm -hmm. of Sri Aurobindo. And I was pin drop silence. There were other people there, Rudolf Steiner's people, oh. and other people were there. Yeah. It was a kind of a symposium in one place. It was in Chicago. And different people presented their viewpoints. And then Madhav was called to present his viewpoint. And when he spoke, there was simply pin drop silence. And after, when his speech was over, the whole audience came like that, just rose from their seats and came towards him and surrounded him. 
and they asked him, We have known before all that you have said here, but we have not heard it presented in this manner, in this harmonious and, yes, rounded way of approach. Everything was included, everything getting its due place. Though we knew some of these things, we have never seen, heard it presented in this manner. Who was your teacher? Uh. And then two separate evenings they fixed for one talk on Sri Aurobindo and the other one talk on the mother. But this was in Chicago? Chicago. Mm -hmm. And the venue was the headquarters of the Theosophical Society. But the platform was open to different people. They had invited different things. They served of an interaction between different faiths, different approaches. And uh, they were all expected. We, Madhav, had not expected such a reception. But you see, it all depends upon whether the mother is present when you are doing this. When mother is there, she is influencing those people. And they don't realize what is drawing them, you know. And some of them have become lifelong friends. The impact of the first meeting was such that they have kept up contact. And even to this day, after Mother has passed away, those who have survived are in touch with us, with our group. It was a lasting impact. So you went from New York to Chicago? No, not immediately from oh. New York, uh, uh, not to Chicago. That came, the Midwest uh, came later. It is in Midwest, isn't that so? Mm -hmm. First are different things. We went up north and in oh. Connecticut, David and uh, Navaja were there. Yes. Then uh, Matagiri. Ah. Yes, Matagiri. And there was some personality development center uh, in Connecticut known to David and Navaja and they had uh, invited Madhav to speak. They liked my Tanpura very much and they asked if uh, they could record the Tanpura and then they got it and then the mother, one Sanskrit hymn. I began with the Sanskrit hymn always and not a concert actually but a little bit of, they said those were not, the Indian f music festivals had not then travelled to those countries. Mm. Only in the big cities, mm. the big Ustads like Ali Akbar Khan, Ravi Shankar and others were there. But in the other cities, nobody knew about these things. So they were eager to hear about the Indian music and all that. Now what could I say? Because Indian devotional music or the Veda, how would they, what would they understand about the Veda? You see, some explanation has to be given, but within 10 minutes or within 15 minutes, I had to give them a sample of uh, Indian music. And with no accompaniment. My friend and teacher Shirin Shroff had told me to record Tanpura on four different pitches so that for whichever composition the pitch suitable I could have. Yeah. So on A and B and C, three, but mostly I was singing on A because of the lower thing for the Sanskrit, you see. B and C will be for other types of music, which I also sang to show that the difference, various kinds of Indian music. So I uh, uh, would take a small uh, tape recorder, a hand one, small one, because I had to keep it near the mic, I had to take a small one, and so I could just get the pitch and then roar, 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 roar slight for me to mm -hmm. hear. And then I would start. People would ask, is it recorded? I said, it's only the pitch, the drone that is recorded. The rest, you know, I'm singing live. So that is what I did. The personality development, they liked it very much. And then afterwards, after the Sanskrit thing, I gave a, a sample of uh, Indian devotional music. And then the next uh, sample, something of the folk music, one of Rabindranath songs. Uh -huh. And so the variety in Indian music, 
according to the time. In the universities, the same thing. In the universities also, though I was not slated to sing, even then they made me sing. Fifteen minutes or something like that mm. before Mother. Within fifteen minutes, I had to fit in different and little, little, little speeches. So I made a program. I made some kind of a program. When we were traveling in the van, I would sit in the back for that was a whole uh, full length thing. If I wanted to lie down, I could lie down. That's what uh, uh, that's uh, the way Stan had fixed it and. Um, then I would keep that small tape recorder and I had taken two or three music books with me too. And then I would see how many minutes I would have to sing in the next place of stop. Mm -hmm. I joked that we were like a traveling circus. The circus. <laughs> we would travel during the day and where we stopped, well, sing for my supper. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, how many minutes I would see according to the program, how many minutes, and I would choose just those pieces which would fit in with that. And I gave the English meaning briefly, because, so that they might follow what I was doing. So I had made a program which was called The Evolution of Indian, the, or the Development of Indian Music, Devotional Music, from the earliest times to the present. Mm. People had presented classical music, of music, the evolution of devotional music, devotional and spiritual music through the centuries up to the present times. Mm. First I would start with the Rik from the Veda. And in the Veda I would explain that at that time only three notes were used. The Riks were chanted with those only three notes. So, the, the, with a great fine spiritual meaning that the Rik, the Rik I would choose from the Rik Veda and with three lines. So, it would be it not like a song but a chant because the it moved between the three notes so there was a melody, short melody. So, you know, it was the original melody in which the Riks are sung by the Pandits. Only when I did it, it became a little more sing-song because I was a singer, you see. <laughs> they would give it and the accents had to be put just right. Yes. In the Sanskrit, some words were emphasized and the accent had to be put right there. Mm. I had copied it like that in Devanagari. So two minutes of Rik, Rik Veda, three minutes from the Upanishads. So the Upanishadic time a little more than three notes were used. Maybe a fourth note was added, another half note or something like that. So a little more was there, melody was there, than the, the Rik one, which I only had to move between three notes. So four or four notes, three and a half, four notes, Upanishadic pattern. Very inspiring verses from the Upanishads. Uh, one or two verses. Then came the Gita. Because after Veda, Upanishad, Gita, these are the three main sacred scriptures, a couplet from the Gita. Yeah, that of course I gave a, a few more notes. Then came the Puranas, the age of the Purana, legends, legends, uh. myths and legends. Purana on Sri Rama Purana, the Bhagavat Purana on the ten avatars of Vishnu. Krishna avatar was one, and the ten avatars of Vishnu. So, all these from the Puranas, Puranas, one thing I would take. And uh, from the Tantra, the famous Guru Stotra, it is from the Tantra. Vishwa Sara Tantra. The Tantra, Vishwa Sara, the essence of the universe. Vishwa, essence of the world. And the name of that santan, the tantra, the tantric text is Vishwa Sara Tantra. From there, the Guru Stotra. Some verses from the Guru Stotra. And you had to do this in 15 minutes. Yes, so from the Guru Stotra, I gave only two couplets. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. According to the time given, yeah. I did only that. According to the time given, I chose the pieces. 
Now, Rick and Upanishadic verse took only three to three minutes or something like that. Rick will, would take just one minute perhaps because it is just recited. And then Shanti Pata is part of um, both Vedic and the Upanishadic thing, Shanti Pata. Swasti Pata, that is aus auspicious words, invoking the auspicious words, that is Swasti Pata. So these are universal, they have universal thing. So any religion can have them because no God is mentioned. So then in Purana, for the first time, the Guru is mentioned. Because in the Tantra, the embodiment of the Divine is made. Mm -hmm. It starts with the, the formless and the qualityless. Guna is qualities. Mm -hmm. The formless and this, from there, the progression is there in that Guru Stotra which is not understandable by all, but you have to see the progression. That is how the poet has written that. The first, the unmanifest, in nothing, and that thing. Then from the unmanifest, a little stir and a quality comes. And so the, the Satchidananda qualities come. And after that, the Guru comes. Because the Guru is the one who points us towards that, that goal, that Padam, the Padam is that station, that Padam Darshitam Yena, that station, that high seat, that high position is shown by whom He is the, to that Guru, by the one who shows us that, to that Guru I bow. So this is the connection to the unmanifest, when it starts taking manifestation and it gives the qualities and all that, then the one who points out to that, points out that, to that Guru I bow. And that is how the verses go. And next few verses, all describe the embodied Brahman and each time, and the one who shows that to us, to that Guru I bow. And finally at the end, the unity of the one who shows the goal and shows the path, it is shown. Then he says, Guru is Brahma, Guru is Vishnu, Guru is Mahadeva. Guru is Verily, the Brahman, to that Guru I bow. So the link between the disciple and the Guru and the highest is... Yeah. And this progression comes verse by verse, verse by verse, verse by verse. And this Guru Stotra is chanted by every spiritual center in India, every Indian spiritual center whether it is the Hindu, Jain, or any of the other sects of the monistic philosophy or the Dvaita philosophy, the dualistic philosophy, or the Vishishta Dvaita, the monified, um, monified, what is it, yes, monism, qualified monism, Advaita Vedanta, the undivided, non-dual Advaita, one, Advaita Vedanta, Dvaita Vedanta, Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta, you see. All those people, no matter what differences are there among themselves, the Guru Stotra is sung. And it is not just a blind adoration of the Guru, as you may know from yeah. this. Yeah. Let's take just one minute. Yeah. One minute. 